So ladies and gentlemen, now that our panel is mostly assembled, or fifths anyway, uh, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome to Baltimore Comic Con. Ah, there's our fifth panelist now. <coughs> Yeah, right here. We're good. So I'm Bob Greenberger, and I have had the privilege of knowing or working with everyone on, on this dais. And when uh, I pitched this panel, it was mostly so I could, you know, have a guaranteed opportunity to talk with old friends. The rest of you have to just eat and Um We are writers, and we are always telling stories. But every now and then. We come across a situation where there's a story we want to tell and it's not the right time, it's not the right opportunity, um, it's too close to the heart or something to that effect. So I'm going to pry those stories out of our panelists or to see what they uh, are willing to share and talk about the process because um, we all talk about what we're doing next month and the next issue of something but what else is, is going on there? Uh, so, the nice thing about the balance of this panel is that everyone here does more than just comic books. The gentleman to my right, who's going to um, start in the introductions, began as a playwright before we sucked him into comics. John Ostrand, talk about yourself. Well, I started off, uh, started off in theater um, back in Chicago, I, but I always loved comics and I wanted to write comics in the worst way, which was what I was doing. And <laughs> uh, my buddy Michael uh, gave me a shot at first comics. And, uh, and from there, you know, when Mike went to DC, he brought me along. Although, Mr. Greenberg and I were already in talks at that point uh, with, with a project that became Suicide Squad. Uh, I wanted to do Challengers of the Unknown, uh, said, well, no, that's taken. Somebody else is working with that. And he said, well, we have this other little title that hasn't been worked with in years. It only appeared in five issues. It's called Suicide Squad. And I said, what a stupid name. <laughs> <laughs> Who in their right minds would join something that calls itself a Suicide Squad? And then the answer came to me. People who don't have any other choice. Who don't have any other choice. Maybe prisoners. Prisoners of the DC Universe. Hmm, that sounds like supervillains. One part supervillains, one part Mission Impossible, one part Dirty Dust. And all of a sudden, and that's what we pitched, and that's, and that's how I wound up at DC. And he's written stuff ever since, so he's a good man. He's been in the galaxy far, far away. Yeah. Well, that's Until they rewrote my galaxy far, far away. <laughs> But that's all right, so it's your same box. Exactly. So, well, to my right, on Mars, who are you? Why are you here? I often wonder that. <laughs> Why am I here? Uh, Roger said I had to show up and be mad at me. Yeah. Kirsten asked me to keep an eye on you. Well, as well she should do. That was probably her just texting. Um, so I, I wrote a bunch of comments. I still write them because I don't want to go get a real job. Um, uh, but I started out as a journalist. I started out as a sports reporter uh, right, out of, uh, right out of college, actually even while I was in college. Um, and uh, I went from being a sports reporter to the entertainment editor, and then Jim Starlin said, hey, do you want to write some comics? And, you know, as you do, you would say yes, so I did. And I've been doing that ever since, uh, 25 years, I think. Um, so again, I, uh, I don't have a real job, I don't really want to get one, so keep buying my comics. Um, because it's a lot more fun to just make stuff up for comics than it is to actually report on what's happening. Uh, I haven't worn a journalist hat in a lot of years, but this job's a lot better. Cool. And to my immediate left, when we Simon said who I was a fan of when she was editing at Marvel before I, I realized what a talented writer she is. Now, remind me, did you do anything other than the editorial work and the writing? I did. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, I started out actually in uh, magazine sales, um, then went to, this is like, not, not selling over the phone, not, not <laughs> by, by Time Magazine. It was um, uh, promoting magazines to the different newsstands and that sort of thing. 
moved into advertising promotion, which promoted our magazine to advertisers. Um, this for, for a publishing company, a magazine publisher. And then uh, I had a friend call me up from uh, a little black and white comic book publisher called Foreign Publishing and said, there's a job opening at my company that you could do and it pays better than your job. And I had read these comics and I said, sure, I'll come over and try. And I applied for the job and I, I was in the production department there for about two weeks before they realized I totally sucked at production. <laughs> but was actually pretty decent at doing like editorial stuff, writing letters, columns, and you know, advertising copy at the time. And um, so they created an assistant editor for position for me. And uh, then I edited, started editing, and then I started writing. And now I do, I write mostly books actually, more than comics these days. So yeah, I've written a lot of different kinds of weird stuff. And the gentleman on my far left is not just a writer, but also a talented artist and a self-made businessman. What's that? So true. Yes, so Terry Moore, <laughs> um, elaborate a little bit on your background, you know, so you all know who you are. Um, this is my third career. I start, my wife married me as a musician in one of those you know, bands that plays around town. And then we started having kids, and I thought, okay, well, that's not going to work. And I went to work as an editor, a film and television editor. So I spent 12 years in a dark room taking massive amounts of footage and putting them into very tight, only what matters. Um, and I got tired of that, and then I discovered the, the indie comic movement, where um, it looked like anybody that wanted one could have a comic book, you know, black and white comic book. This was back in 92. So I thought, well, you know, I love drawing comics. I've been doing it since I was a kid for myself. So I drew the first chap, the first issue of Strangers in Paradise in the kitchen at night. It took me three days to draw this. And went to a show like this, and we took my Xerox and handed it to everybody that was in the business, even the retailers, and um, got only positive feedback, even from the DC guy that was drawn as Superman at the time, uh, John Bogdanovi. Bogdanovi. Yeah, he said, Bogdanovi is, I would say, in my country. <laughs> <laughs> and he is from another country, Texas. So. <laughs> um, but it was weird because I was a very private person, and that shows. For some reason, I found my balls and <laughs> I took the Xerox and I went up even to the guys that had only bad girl art posted, all the TNA stuff. And I said, would you put this in your store if I printed it? And they were flipping through this and then they finally came to the scene where Francine was taking her clothes off in the park. He said, yeah, we'll buy this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I went home very encouraged and I drew the second issue and uh, somebody picked it up and boom, I was off and running, and I had to go back. So I've been doing comics since 1930. Um, and I just, it always works best for me to do it indie. Um, everybody with a brain works for a company, and um, I'm just not a good employee, so I keep doing my own comics. Okay, so, yeah, as you can see, there's a breadth of experience that, you know, has filled this table, but also different experiences at, entering the field at different times. So there are stories they've told and stories they haven't told. Why haven't you told these stories? Well, what are these stories that are lurking in the back of your mind that are waiting to come out? Anybody? You guys all agreed to be on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I think any writer uh, has lots of ideas. Uh, in fact, that's one of the fun things people, I've had people come up and tell me that they have a wonderful deal for me. They got this great idea for a story, so they'll tell it to me and I'll write it, and then we'll split the profits. <laughs> <laughs> like A, there be any profits, and B, and B that, that my share is, or that their share should be equal to mine. Um, I have plenty of ideas. The problem is not ideas. The, uh, the, the problem is uh, gathering them together. I think for, for every idea of, of a series, let alone an individual book, I've got, I've got somewhere in my journals, I've got at least 10 or 20 ideas that, that just haven't seen the light of day or just haven't made it. 
A, part of the reason is because my views show up. Um, maybe a, uh, I, I can't find a publisher who's interested in it. Although, with uh, crowdfunding these days, you can, if you want to work real hard, uh, give the money uh, to do it and publish it yourself, which is what Tom Mangard and I are doing with, uh, with Cross Hello Drum. Um, and that was an idea that has been 10 years simmering and now it's going to come out. But I've got lots, lots of other stories, and I bet every single person on this panel also must have just gobs of, of stories or story ideas or concepts that they haven't yet gotten out to, them, to you guys. Is this true? Do you have gobs of stories you're waiting to tell? Drops more than gobs. Um, let's see. What was the, the, the stories? Of, one of them is the the sequel to Galactus the Devourer, which probably nobody's even heard of. It was a, a Silver Surfer story in which um, uh, just Galactus is destroyed. And the second part of that, which will never, I think somebody may eventually have done it, I've, or done a similar story where I, my idea was that the Silver Surfer was. It was specifically the Silver Surfer was taken to be the Silver Surfer, Surfer because Galactus was grooming him to be the new Galactus. Galactus knew he was going mad. He knew he would have to be destroyed. He chose the Silver Surfer because he thought the Silver Surfer could destroy him and then would assume the mantle of Silver Surfer. But I believe that one probably, has, this, 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 has something like that been done? This is something. Okay, well it would, it would have been a great story. I did the first half and then the second half um, there were all sorts of editorial changes, and people were hired and people were fired. So I only did the first half of it, um, and then the second half of it never got done. So that, that was that's one story. Now I'm not going to tell the others until somebody else tells one of theirs. Well, yes. actually, I mean, talking about editorial changes, there, though, Terry, you did dip your toe into the mainstream at DC for a little bit on, on Birds of Prey. That proved to be sadly short-lived. Uh, did you have other stories you were going to tell there? Yeah, actually, and I'll hear, this is this will be an upbeat story. Upbeat's good. <laughs> um, this is an upbeat fail. Uh, I, was at, I was writing Birds of Prey, and my, I had been campaigning for years to write Batman because I despised the guy. And I said, <laughs> and I was telling the editor, I said, you need to get somebody writing him that really hates him because he likes to be whipped. So I will think of plenty of ways to beat that guy into the ground. And um, you need to have somebody running him that really hates him. And I mean, I'm always pulling for the Joker. So I was writing Birds of Prey, because, and I took the job only because um, Oracle was the only one he was listened to. This is back when he was wandering around with a brain tumor or something. Uh, yeah, I don't know, he had a sprained ankle and he was having a bad year. And uh, <laughs> was, he, he, he was having such a bad year, he grew a beard. Uh, come on, really. Um, so anyway, I, had, I wanted to do this character in Birds of Prey. I wanted to, the only way to leave your mark in mainstream is to create new characters and leave them as a legacy. Okay, that's so-and-so's character. So I had this little short list, and one of them was going to be this um, girl that I call Dead Girl. This is before I realized that uh, Mike Allred had already come up with this name. But as the working title was Dead Girl, and they would encounter her at night, like Catwoman, have a fight, and she would get killed, step in front of a bus, fall off the building. We go to the morgue, we see her put into a slab, everything, you know, it's sad. The next night he's out, he's wrestling with the consequences of it, as he would want to do, having his stomach ache, popping his, uh, you know, uh, antacid pills, and whatever that little schlep does. And he runs across her again. She's back. And it's because I had seen this movie with Tommy Lee Jones uh, called Gotham, where he fell in love with the ghost who kept showing up and all that. And that left a mark on me. It's not a great movie, but the concept is terrific. So I walk around with this technology. And I only lasted a few issues on the series because of the editorial stuff, because I would write a script that would have 14 scenes and they would cut it down to three because the others couldn't work because of continuity. If I wanted to use another character and put him on his island out in the Canary Islands, 
No, I've got to be busy over here with the Silver Surfer. I want to, you know, go to Manhattan. No, Manhattan's being torn apart right now by somebody. So it would come down to my last chapter that I wrote book I wrote, I mean, they, they basically put me into a, they have to have a fist fight in the field. And I was going to tear up half a coffee, but, so anyway, it didn't work out. But, so I left with Dead Girl in my pocket, and years later, when I finished Echo and Strangers of Paradise, I pulled it back out and named her Rachel Rising. So my whole Rachel Rising is a DC character that I never got a chance to write. And, 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 that's all, that's and, and that's now it's yours. Great. Now it's mine. Yeah. That's, great. And therein lies the lesson. Uh, you, know, I, you know, I think what John said is absolutely right. We, we all have more ideas than we will ever get to in our lifetimes. I, I know this for a fact. Uh, there's so many stories I want to tell, but there are, there's a finite amount of time and there's a finite amount of resources for you to tell those stories. And, and I think that the difference of what kind of we're discussing here is that there are there are work for hire stories, which is what we do when we go work for Marvel or DC or or IDW or Dynamite or Boom on something that that company owns. You know, and then I, you know, I've done that gig for 25 years. It's great. It's a great way to pay the mortgage, but it's not yours. Uh, ultimately, uh, I think of probably a lot of the stories that we haven't told as storytellers um, are because editorial wouldn't let us tell those stories for one reason or another. For, for the reasons that Weezy said, for her Galactus story. Um, for, I had Hal Jordan stories I wanted to tell that in the 90s smacked too much of multiple universes and we set the whole thing up and then at the last minute, uh, DC Editorial got cold feet and said, yeah, let's not do that. Let's put all that off to the side. So, um, the big difference is when you're doing work for hire, somebody else ultimately is telling you what to do. Like John and I both worked on Star Wars, John far more than I did, um, but I generally, I, had, I would have people ask me, well, what's that like to, you know, Lucasfilm really, really awful to work with in terms of approvals, and I, I didn't find it to be any different than working for Marvel or DC, as long as you can go to them and say something stupid like, well, Luke Skywalker's a lady now. Um, you know, you just you just knew what stories you could tell and what you couldn't, and you stayed within the guidelines, just like if you were working on Superman or Batman or, or whatever. Um, but you know, when you're a pro, you sort of understand those parameters and stay within them um, until you get to the edge of it, and then the editor bumps you back in and says, "No, we're not doing that." It might be the story you've always wanted to tell with Batman, for instance, um, but. Uh, you don't get to make those decisions. Whoever owns the copyright makes those decisions. Um, I, found, I found that Star Wars, actually, in terms of the continuity, which is which is tangled in a mess, but in terms of letting me do what I want, uh, they were far more forthcoming and easy to work with than the X Men office. Yeah, I, I you know, the, the Star Wars stuff that I did, I for me the process was like, you know, once they sort of got to trust you, that you were somebody that. You know, wasn't going to go too far off the reservation and, and you know go nuts, and they had to pay attention to you. Pretty much got your stuff approved. Yeah, uh, and it, it, it's much like that in any at the big two. You know, you, you sort of build up some professional trust. Um, the, the flip side of that coin is is you know is what Terry's done his whole career, which is create your own stuff. Uh, nobody tells you you can't do anything. That's that's the true beauty of create your own is. Um, the only reason that, that we won't get to tell the creator own stories that we want to tell is because we don't have enough time or there aren't enough resources. But there's nobody to tell you no. That's the, the creator own stuff that I've done has always been the most satisfying for me because good, bad, or indifferent, it's the story you wanted to tell and it turns out the way you wanted it to turn out. Um, that's why I think you see most people in this business uh, particularly writers, because we can balance the time better, doing a chunk of creator own work and a chunk of, of uh, <coughs> work for hire stuff. Uh, the work for hire stuff uh, tends to pay the bills on a regular basis. The the creator own stuff is is what you love. The creator own stuff is is the stuff that's always nearer and dearer to your heart. I mean, I loved all the stuff I've done for Marvel and DC for the most part. Uh, you know, created a Green Lantern for him that. You know, people still bring copies for me to sign, and that's cool, that's awesome, but I don't love that as much as the stuff that I created from the ground floor, because 
that's wholly and completely yours and it didn't exist before. You know who else talks like this? It's musicians. There's a difference between having being solo or in a great band. There's a difference between having a solo album or you're in a really good band that can good albums. It, it, it's fun, both are fun, but there, it's a different feeling. Yeah, they're both they're both great, but but ultimately if you you know, if you come to me at a show and say, "What's you know, what's your favorite thing?" I'm gonna, I'm not gonna tell you Green Lantern. I'm gonna tell you, you know, one of my creator-owned books because uh, there's more of me into that. Uh, as much as I might like what I did on Green Lantern and had a great time doing it for seven years, it's ultimately not mine. Once you walk away from it, somebody, you know, it, it might feel like your kid, but once you walk away from it, somebody else raises your kid. It's so that, it's that way with everything. Things. If you had bought a Picasso. You're just keeping it for a while. It's yours for a while until it gets passed on. It's going to end up in somebody else's hands. Yeah, and, and it, which isn't to say that it's it's a bad gig, and I'm sure all of us have a list of you know Batman or Superman or X-Men stories that we would love to tell at some point. But um, there are so many other factors involved in getting to tell those stories. You know, it's I have, if yeah. you got a, if you got a great X-Men story to tell. It's probably got a lot more to do with what Fox Studios is going to do with that movie than than your story. That's just the reality. I mean, uh, I had a Batman story that I wanted to do a couple years ago, but it was an Elseworlds story. At the time when they stopped doing Elseworlds story, I wanted to set it back you know, in the 30s, and uh, it starts off the same way with Bruce's parents getting killed, but Bruce is also killed. So, okay, so it's like a really short story. No. <laughs> It's longer in the tunnel. This can uh, be There's so much outrage about this boy getting killed that they bring in an outside uh, hard nosed detective named Jim Corrigan. Ah. And in my story, uh, Wayne becomes the specter. Boy Wayne becomes the specter. And uh, Corrigan, finding that his hands are tied by corruption, creates himself as Batman. Eventually. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and eventually, of course, they wind up in the collision, of course. But I'll never be able to do it because, you know, they tell, well, Elseworlds, Elseworlds don't sell anymore. So I can't do it. Okay, there's, there's the other side where you're actually standing in Karen Berger's office. And she says, what ideas do you have? And I pitched three of them in five minutes. She said, I like all three of those. Do them all. And so I said, yeah, yeah, this was a good meeting. And I walked out. And talked to the editor in charge of the books that I was talking about. And um, I never could get past the first things with the editor. Probably. Her boss had approved them, but the book editor uh, kept handing my things back. You know, no, it's not quite right. That's too messianic. That's too da da da. That's too da da da. So sometimes you sell the pitch, the pitches, the pitches up here sound good, and then when they get down into the nuts and bolts, the editor, the editor just picks it apart until you just kind of like, okay. We, we see you've been on both sides of the desk. You probably have had to say to writers, I can't, you know, the story doesn't work because of the larger issues. How is it being on the other side of the desk, you know, being told that yourself? Well, you know, I think, you know, stories don't work for larger issues. I mean, and, and, and for a lot of different reasons. Um, I think a lot of stories don't work now because of weird continuity that you're, you know, like, saying you, you know, I don't know, the purple panty waist is over here tearing up the city, so therefore your character can't be over here, I don't know, having a picnic or whatever it was you would want them to do. Um, I, I guess back in the day when I, when stories didn't work, mostly I worked with people who were really, really good. That was my choice as an editor because it made my life very, very easy. Um, you know, they bring stuff in and they would, that I would say, oh gee, that's brilliant, terrific, let's go, and it would get done. And that was, but that was back in the day when editors actually had power. Mm -hmm. I mean, nowadays the editors don't. No, no, the upper echelons do. Uh, I don't know that I could do the work that I did um, no. back then. I don't like, think I could like, be an editor like I was.